Okay, it is 325, so we will go ahead and get started. Thank you for attending 2020 Sunstone Digital Symposium Session 163, titled Mormon or Ex-Mormon? How about a third choice? The audio from this session will be available for purchase at sunstone.org after the symposium. The video recording of this session will be available in the Whova app for approximately three months, beginning at the end of August 2020. We will be having a question and answer section at the end of the presentation. Please submit any questions in the Whova app under the presentation to get those answered. If you don't submit a question, you can also vote for other ones if you see some that you are specifically interested in. Also, please note on the Zoom app, some people have been doing the hand raise. You're, we aren't using that really, and so if you would like to have any interaction with the speaker, please use the app to submit your question. At Sunstone, we are making it a goal to build a community that allows many ways for people to express their faith. Our tagline is, there is more than one way to Mormon. We invite you to help us build a community where all paths are given space to be better understood. Please support us in our mission by making a donation and subscribing at sunstone.org. Now here is a little bit about this presentation. It feels like the church is to stay or go, to be Mormon or ex-Mormon. Why do we have to accept this binary? There are a lot of other choices that don't entail giving up your Mormon identity. Go on sabbatical, hold fast to your Mormonism, just make it your own, and don't let anyone tell you that you have to make a choice. This session is guaranteed to upset ex-Mormons and Mormons alike. And then here is a little bit of an introduction for our speaker. 
Mehdi Ivy Harrison is the author of the national best-selling Linda Walheim series, beginning with The Bishop's Wife. She also is the author of multiple Book of Mormon fanfic, such as The Book of Laman, as well as Vampires in the Temple, published by BCC Press. She hosts the Mormon Sabbatical podcast. Thank you, Mehdi, for being here, and we will give the time to you. Let me just stop sharing. All right, go ahead. All right, I don't know um, how many of you are here because you're fans of mine and you're excited to see me, and how many are here because they're hoping to light me on fire um, and watch me go up in flames. So I'm going to try to avoid doing that latter, although I do feel a little bit like um, I have volunteered as tribute in the Hunger Games and everybody is just watching with popcorn to see who eats me next. Um, I okay, let me let me go to my presentation. So I can talk about things in the order I wanted to talk about them. Um, so I, I guess I was going to say first, this was not my title for this presentation. So I've cobbled together bits and pieces of what I originally intended to talk about, which was like a permanent sabbatical. And then after the blow up um, over the last several weeks, um, I thought I would add in a few other things. So if you have not followed the blow up, go back home and <laughs> look up um, my interview on Mormon land. And then after that, you can go and read my five doctrines of ex-Mormonism. <sighs> let's see what to say about it um I, I talk about coffee and alcohol use among ex-mormons i talk about the new scriptures that i feel like i am frequently introduced to in ex-mormon circles mostly written by white dudes um i i also feel like there's a science holds the truth insistence in these circles and while it's not that i don't believe in science it's that i am skeptical of the institution of science which i feel like is um just as patriarchal as mormonism <laughs> and so i am hyper allergic to patriarchal systems and therefore i do not put my trust wholeheartedly within science um in fact seeing white dudes in suits anywhere is a bit triggering to me um now the happy narrative i wanted to talk about is slightly different um I, one of the reasons I stepped into ex-Mormonism as a circle is that I kept hearing these promises from people who were ex-Mormon that they were much happier after they had left Mormonism. And when I was in that in-between space, shifting between Mormonism and ex-Mormonism, I was very, very unhappy. I was unhappy because I'd lost my community. I was unhappy because I didn't know which way was up. Um, I didn't know if I believed in God anymore. And this idea that, oh, if you just join an ex-Mormon community, then you'll be happy again, was very appealing to me. And um, now I'm extremely suspicious of that narrative because I think that happiness is in fact an emotion. And like all emotions, it's very fleeting. And anybody who promises you happiness maybe is a bit like um, what Wesley says in The Princess Bride, life is pain, anyone who, it says differently is trying to sell you something. So I'm worried now that this idea of finding happiness somewhere is really a kind of promotional tool. And I do think a lot of ex-Mormons feel like they need to dismantle the narrative of Mormonism that when that that wickedness whenever was happiness. And so there's this need to project. But I also do not want to do play that game anymore. I don't want to pretend to be happy when I'm not happy. That was one of the burdens of Mormonism that I want to give up. Um, so uh, it, it feels to me like happy, this happiness narrative is part of a cult. And I have wondered if leaving an organization that has cult-like qualities has left me vulnerable to other organizations with cult-like qualities who promise happiness or who love bomb. Um, and, and I have become suspicious of that. So let me just talk a little bit about, um, oh, I'm going to get to the what's wrong with me. Just give me a minute. I just wrote an essay um, over the last hour about trying to figure out what it meant when I got such a backlash of responses from, from this essay on five doctrines of ex-Mormonism. And, and um, a lot of people looked up another essay of mine, which you can find on Medium called uh, Letter to an Ex-Mormon Man. 
And um, at first I was really blindsided because I publish essays every week, sometimes more often than once a week. Um, and I published probably 50 essays with Jana Reese at um, Religion News Service. She has, she, uh, we have a standing deal that I send her a guest post every month. And sometimes the Salt Lake Tribune picks these up and sometimes they don't. Um, when the Tribune picks them up, they usually get a lot more play, but I can never predict which essays they're gonna pick up and which ones they aren't. When they don't get picked up, Honestly, my essays on Medium often have fewer than 100 readers. So that is sort of my assumption generally is that my essays will get about 100 readers. And I did not expect the response that I got. I did not expect the anger and the, I think really hurt was behind the anger. I thought people were just gonna kind of nod along and say, oh, that's sort of funny. Yeah, I mean, we have some problems. Um, and, and I've had a, a little bit of time to reconsider what happened. And I have ended up realizing that uh, the saying that once you leave Mormonism, that that ex-Mormons actually attack each other more than they attack Mormons, I think is true on some level because we are wounded. We're traumatized and wounded animals. And um, we have all been wounded by different parts of Mormonism and we're all on different um, stations along this journey away we're all looking inside of ourselves trying to see what parts of us that were mormon um we want to keep what parts we don't want to keep but it takes a long time and for someone like me who left at almost age 50 it's going to be a long time for my kids who left at a younger age it seems like it's been a lot easier for them to demormonize themselves and i don't even know that i want to demormonize myself but i do want to be aware of the parts of me that are connected to Mormonism, the ideas that I hold. But it's a long process. It feels like every other week I will realize in the middle of the night at 3 a.m., bing, there's another part of you that is built on the foundation of Mormonism, on, on the, the assumptions and the values of Mormonism. Let's look at that more carefully. And of course, my order of figuring out what things are Mormon inside of me is different than everybody else's order. And the things that led me out of Mormonism, which were patriarchy and the authority structure, are different than the things that led other people out of Mormonism. And so when I criticize ex-Mormonism, I am criticizing a group of people who have their own traumas and wounds that are still open. And, um, and they are just aware of different sharp edges of themselves than I am aware of. And I think they are in a different place than I am in. And so I'm trying to learn to grant some grace to people who are hurt when I tell them, oh, by the way, here's another thing that you're not good at. Here's another way in which you are not enough. When the reason they left Mormonism was because they were tired of the cycle of shame and guilt and never being enough. And here I am sounding perhaps to them very much like a Mormon person saying, you are not enough again. And they don't want uh, someone to heap on them another list of things that they have to improve on. Whereas for me, my problem is not that I don't wanna do a list of things. I was actually very good at the Mormon list and checklist thing. I, that wasn't why I left Mormonism. Ultimately, I left Mormonism because I got tired of other people always being in charge of me. And so again, in my ex-Mormon experiences where it feels like other people are in charge of me, I get very prickly about that. So that's my explanation. Um, I do also wanna talk a little bit about how autism affects the way that I interact in the world. Um, I was diagnosed with autism in 2017 at the age of 46, but I have been autistic my whole life. Um, and I sought out a diagnosis because I had hoped for understanding myself a little better. Um, I, I liked getting the diagnosis in some ways. One of the ways was that it made sense of my life. It made sense of how lonely I was in childhood, that I didn't have any friends until I was almost in middle school. It made sense of the problems that I still have to this day of understanding facial expressions and fitting in. Um, sometimes people say that I'm socially awkward and that's definitely true, but it comes along with a whole host of other things. Um, let's see, here's a description. I struggle in large groups. I don't parse body language and facial expressions well. I tend to take things literally. 
I don't get jokes. <laughs> I don't dress the right way, and I refuse to follow a whole bunch of rules about how to be a woman, leaving me to wonder if I'm actually a gender or something like that. If I cared about your stupid labels, <laughs> then maybe I'd attach myself to that label, but I don't. In any case, I don't do teamwork. I'm not nice for the sake of being nice. I don't hold my tongue when it would be better for me to do so. I don't show deference to power. Some days, and a lot of those days have been in this last month, I really, really wished that I could do some of those things. I've spent time reconsidering my decision to let go of a lot of the masking strategies that served me well for a couple of decades letting me pass as normal, and at least to some degree making people like me. Masking is a phrase that is used in particular to describe uh, adult autistic women. It's one of the reasons why we did not get diagnosed as children because we mask so well. We, we hide our autism behind a mask of normalcy, but it costs us. Um, whenever people talk about, quote, the best they could do, unquote, I argue because we can never do the best that we can do. How could, what does that mean? And when therapists say that if you dislike parts of yourself, you can discard them and become a new self, I will argue to the death on this point. I don't get to choose whether I'm autistic or not. I only get to choose, choose whether I show my real autism or I fake it. And I get to deal with all the consequences of sensory overload and emotional overwhelm and night in my bed when my head explodes and I have a meltdown. I suppose you could say that I speak truth to power because of that autism, but the reality is that I'm just the I'm I'm just the girl confused about everybody saying the emperor has new clothes when it's obvious the emperor is naked. I feel like that is how my essays are all of the time. I don't understand how people are hurt by them at least at first because I'm not good at the social interaction part, and I just blurt out whatever comes to my head. Um, and I'm very worried that I'm going to end up joining about six different cults before I figure this thing out, before I figure myself out, or maybe just before I give up on other humans and lose all trust in them completely. All right, so this is my slide on what is wrong with me. I, whenever I have something like this happen, I end up saying, what is wrong with me? So is it because I'm autistic? Is it because I'm not happy, not a team player? I can't follow rules. <laughs> um, I'm always trying to make things better. That is, I'm always a critic. I, I just am never, I, I can't settle with the way things are. And also I wonder how much of it is just a, being a woman in a space in which people still expect women to act in a particular way and I'm not acting in that way. And also there's always this double bind. Like if women don't talk like men, then we're told you should talk like men. <laughs> and if we, um, but, but if we do, then we're told that we are too loud or we're rude. But if we talk like women, then nobody pays attention to us. So it feels like all of those are playing a role in this situation. All right, there I am. I'm even wearing the same shirt here. Um, I've made a list of groups that I feel like have excommunicated me so far in my life. <laughs> um, first, it was the feminists because I got pregnant in graduate school. Yes, on purpose. What kind of good feminist does that? Then it was the ac academy. I'm still not entirely sure why that happened. Was it because I said I wanted a commercial career as a writer or because I was autistic and didn't know it and never said the right thing to people in power and never learned how to do group committee work? Um, sometimes people assume that it was because I was a liberal at BYU, but that is not why. I was not a liberal at that time. I was very, very conservative and quite a strict Mormon in almost every way. And I don't think that my problems at BYU were caused by um, by, by some sense that I was going to eventually leave the church. Um, then it was the children's writing community. I was interviewed by a local paper and said some good things and some bad things about the dawn of Utah children's writing. They were true things, but because this person was dying, I was apparently not supposed to say these things. I admit, I do not understand the rules about death and dying and not being allowed to say the truth anymore after someone is dead. I admit that according to these rules, I was a terrible person who deserved to be shunned by most of the members of that community. Then it was the Mormons who excommunicated me. Yes, it wasn't a, an official excommunication, just the informal shunning that my people are so good at. And now the ex-Mormons seem to have joined that group of excommunicating many. Both of these groups have engaged in pleas of, we need your voice. And I'm not entirely sure if that is the reflex of niceness, the demand that I say because I'm useful, because I say things other people know are true but don't want to take the heat for saying, or if it's just a ritual phrase that means nothing at all. I am who I am, but I'm not sure how that means I will fit into spaces with the rest of you. 
And my little joke there, I don't know, can you get excommunicated from Sunstone? If anybody does, I'm sure it will be me. Um, all right, so now this is the talk that I wrote before all of this blew up. Um, I hear a lot of people talking about when they leave Mormonism that they are the same person. So my, ex my experience was very much the opposite. When I had my faith crisis, I felt like I had changed radically. And this is a poem I wrote then. I'm not the same person I was. I look in the mirror and see the marks of pain and age in the lines on my face, in the sagging jowls, the frown lines and the crow's feet, the red nose and trail of tears from eyes to chin. I'm not the same person I was. I can't watch that show. No matter how well written, if a child dies in the end, I can't hold my bladder like I used to or run without a limp. I will always look back, always second guess every choice. I will always say I love you to my kids if it is, as if it is for the last time, because it may be. And even if they survive, they will come back changed and I will be new again too. All right, every time I talk to someone about leaving Mormonism, they end up sharing a story with me about how they were ignoring their true self for a long time or they feel like they finally stopped pretending. Well, that ha wasn't how it was for me. For me, there was a break in my sense of self. I don't think I'm the same person I used to be. Um, I'm working on this in therapy, I admit, trying to figure out how I came to be this person and somehow feel like this is the person I was supposed to be. But honestly, there are a lot of times when I have these moments of existential confusion where I can't remember how I came to be this person I am today and where the person I used to be is so angry because this isn't the future she worked for. She was supposed to end up somewhere else and it feels like someone hijacked her body. So how did I get here? This is another really common narrative we tell in these settings. What was your faith crisis? What was your shelf item? What was the thing that made it impossible for you to stay? The problem is that I think that we humans are very good at telling stories that make us feel like coherent selves, making sense of the world. Like I'm a writer, this is what I do. I write stories with, with this idea of a creative of a, a self that remains the same story after story. We are really good at assuring ourselves that we are the same person, even with evidence to the contrary. And we are really bad at figuring out what things are actually motivating us to do, what we are going to do or already have done. That is, I think that our subconscious is often in charge of stuff. And then we make up a story afterwards to justify what our subconscious had us do. So there, there are all of these stories of why I left. I could tell you about my daughter's stillbirth in 2005 and the suicidal depression that followed and the stupid things that people told me that this was God telling me to stay home with my kids, which I was already doing, or that there was some lesson that I would learn that would make me glad this happened to me, or that my baby had just been a body and that her spirit had gone to another family. Aren't you comforted by that? Or that I should keep fasting and praying and fasting and praying until I got an answer for why, something that never ever happened even at my most suicidal moments. This is the story of why I left that I tell most often. It is the most obvious shift in my sense of self. And it's the story I tell in the first episode of my podcast, The Mormon Spadical. And yet there are all of these other stories I could tell about my father, who was abusive and controlling, who made it difficult for me to see a male God as anything other than abusive and controlling. When I was finally able to say to myself, he was abusive, it was only a few months before he died in hospice. And I began to see how my journey away from Mormonism was related to my journey toward this reality. And it's really impossible to disentangle them and yet too reductive to say that I left Mormonism because I could never find a relationship with God that wasn't like my relationship to my father. Because I did, and I do still have a relationship with God, though my God wears a female presenting face to me most of the time now. Then I could tell the story of my nephew by chosen family, who came out as transgender in 2010 and how I suddenly saw LGBT plus Mormons everywhere and was appalled at how our church had always treated them and continued to treat them. How I tried to write books about faithful transgender Mormons who have always been there. How I tried to protest the November 2015 policy by wearing black to church every week for more than three years. How I wore a rainbow ribbon to mark myself safe for the LGBT plus Mormons in my ward, but really only mark myself as unsafe to everyone else who was trying to follow the prophet. How I argued with the former stake president's wife about the policy and told her that it was causing suicides. And she told me that we had to follow the prophet and trust God was behind him because otherwise we weren't Mormons anymore. And so I decided I wasn't Mormon anymore. I could also tell the story of my second daughter who left Mormonism when she was 13, just after she'd completed the Young Womanhood Award in the shortest time of anyone in the history of our ward. 
and then did it all a second time when they added virtue. She lied to me at first, told me that she was going to a friend's church when she stayed home, and then I caught her in her bedroom when I went home to get something, and I realized in that moment that I had to make a decision. Was I going to be the kind of parent who threatened consequences if she didn't attend church? Or was I going to be the kind of parent who listened and understood why she couldn't go anymore? She said she didn't believe in God. And was I going to love her as much or even more for her courage? This moment was important for the other children in my family, now all gone out of Mormonism as well, because it was their way of seeing that they could leave too and that we would love them no matter what. And strangely enough, it showed me Two, that rejecting the contract that demanded obedience in exchange for safety and submission in exchange for community was wrong. No lightning struck her. She went on with her life just as she had before, but a little more free, a little more herself, just as I eventually did. I could tell the story about the BYU Honor Code scandal and what happened when the bishop's wife asked me to talk about my experience with tithing. So I stood up and talked about all those years I'd struggled to have enough money to pay tithing, sometimes taking back wrapped presents already under the Christmas tree in order to get back to even with God. And then when I hit the moment that tithing didn't hurt financially at all anymore, I found I couldn't morally reconcile it with my conscience because I couldn't allow money that I could send somewhere else to end up supporting rape culture and actual rape in the university I'd once been proud to have been named an Ezra Taft Menson scholar of. All of these stories are true. I don't know if any of them are really the reason that I stopped attending. Maybe it was just a midlife crisis. Maybe I stopped being able to fit myself into the neurotypical box once I was diagnosed with autism. Maybe I finally just used up too much energy and found I was greedy for what remained as I age and discover the supply is far from infinite these days. Maybe I just hate men as some have thrown at me. Maybe I just don't want to be happy. There is something about me, even now, that refused to, refuses to let go completely of Mormonism and to stop engaging entirely with the church of my family heritage and perhaps of my soul. Though I spent time trying out a few different churches, one with a dear Catholic friend, another with my son's girlfriend whose parents were Methodist, I didn't feel at home in either of them. Perhaps there is a spiritual home for me out there somewhere. And I, have, I did mention in my um, interview with Peggy that I am considering community of Christ. I att have attended one of their services and I liked it, we'll see. I'm not making any promises here. I will go where I feel called to go. And yes, I still feel called to th things. I still feel something out there. Is it God? I don't know. Maybe it's just my own imagination, my own wish for there to be a God who loves me and saves me from the, the terribly alone and pointless feeling I had for the brief time when I was an atheist. When I told the primary presidency that I wasn't coming back in January, they told me this isn't the way that people leave Mormonism. You don't go from full activity one week to staying home the next. <laughs> You're lazy if you leave Mormonism and you want to sin. You decide that coffee and alcohol matter to you more than God and the blessings of eternity. You get tired of wearing garments because who doesn't get tired of them? You take them off one summer day when it's just too hot to stand it and then slowly, week by week, you wear them less and less until you don't wear them at all but that wasn't my story. I made a conscious choice to step away. I told the primary presidency when pressed that I thought Russell Nelson was an evil man, not a prophet. <laughs> this at least stopped them from asking me any more questions about why I was leaving. I was, as always, too blunt, too honest, too loud, too much, always, always too much. I'm aware now more than ever that it's probably impossible for me to stop being Mormon, just as it is impossible for me to stop being autistic. I can mask it, I can pretend I'm not Mormon anymore, but it will always come out eventually and it's just going to cost me more in the end if I don't come terms, to terms with who I am and what the possibilities are within that framework. A couple of my kids, as I said before, who left in their early teens simply do not identify as Mormon anymore. They ask me sometimes why I keep wanting to talk about and process Mormonism and my identity as a Mormon woman-ish. I guess I don't have a great answer to this question, except that I didn't leave until I was 50. <clears throat> I can't take a pill and cure my Mormonism. It is the soil that grew me, as Ibram Kendi says of racism. I can work on seeing it. I can work on let letting go parts of it. I don't know that I'm interested in ending Mormonism at the moment. I'm not sure I even want to change it and make it better now. Those all seem like very Mormon things to do, <laughs> but if that works for you, you do you. 
So what do I want now? I want to figure out the questions that are interesting to me. I want to see myself and others more clearly. I want to work towards having an open mind so that I'm not afraid of even more questions and not afraid of answers or non-answers, whichever come to me. I want to come back to God, whatever that God looks like, because honestly, I love the spiritual aspects of Mormonism that took me out of my body and my limited space and broke open the world for me again and again. I love that I learned deep repentance while I was Mormon, how, not, how to not just forgive or be forgiven, but to be transformed in that process into someone who now understood another person on a completely different level. As part of this process, I suspect many of you know well, I'm sorting through my deepest parts of self, examining things and deciding how to reconceive many of the foundational parts of my identity and its connections to Mormonism. I've been surprised at how some things are attached to other things that make it, well, complicated. All right, eternal progression. This often ends up on people's lists of things that they still love after Mormonism, and it's on one of my lists of things that I'm still looking at carefully. I once preached loudly about the wonderful doctrine of Mormonism that would lead us to godhood. Now that I've concluded that godhood seems mostly reserved for men, while women are going to continue in some kind of hidden, silent, servile role, I'm not sure how much I like this idea of godhood. And ultimately, all descriptions of godhood are tainted with mortal ideas of righteousness, and mostly masculinity and power. So what to do? I do believe in the importance of learning and growing though I tend not to use the word repentance in this. I also don't find sin to be a particularly useful construct. Eternal progression, I don't know, maybe I'd replace it with the phrase growth mindset. I used to be excited to tell people that Mormons believe in universal salvation and resurrection, but is that true anymore? Was it ever true? It seems that as soon as Joseph had a vision of three kingdoms, universal re resurrection took a back seat to lists to prescribe obedience. If you can put people in hierarchies, you can demand obedience and compliance to your rules. So now what? I really don't have any idea. I told you I was gonna answer, I was gonna ask questions and not give you answers and I'm trying to come to terms with that. All right, the next one, personal revelation. I used to love the idea that a young boy went to the woods and prayed and God appeared to him. The same could happen to any kid, right? Well, no. <laughs> That doesn't seem to be the message of Mormonism anymore. And frankly, it was always a dangerous doctrine, wasn't it? That anyone could get messages from God. What about prophets then? What do you need them for? What if your message disagrees with theirs? And that is, in fact, what happened to me again and again. That When I went to God, I got a different message. And that is the journey that led me away from formal affiliation with the church. I love the idea of restoration, the idea that God would restore all truths, it, but it, until I started to think about the old truths and realized I didn't believe in them and thought, in fact, that it was best those old truths be allowed to die. Um, stoning your children for being disobedient, for instance, or women for um, being adulterous, in quotes. So what is truth? How does one restore truth that has been lost without keeping some of the really bad prejudice ideas that come with that old worldview? I don't know the answer to this, but sometimes this idea of like restoring old truths reminds me of my atheist friend who told me that whenever she heard theists arguing, it always sounded to her like they were saying, my invisible flying fairy is more powerful than your invisible flying fairy. I'm not sure she's wrong. <laughs> I don't want to sound like that. Somehow I want to still have something. Um, I don't know if restoration is the right word for it, but I want to have some idea of truth. Can it be universal? I really don't know. Um, all right. The next one, the feminine divine. When I told my Catholic friend that I was still attached to the idea of Heavenly Mother in the Mormon construction, he tried to gently suggest to me that God was not mortal and didn't need to be male or female. It was all a metaphor for our relationship to God, but there were other metaphors. He also suggested that Catholicism Mary is a space for the divine feminine in another tradition. Since then, I have noticed the divine feminine in many other places, and I can't help but think that the all-male leadership of the church just don't care that much about making our doctrine more robust. And maybe if they turned to it, they would make it into something I didn't like anyway. So now I'm happy to conceive of it in my own way, the way I did in my book, The Women's Book of Mormon. So I never say in The Women's Book of Mormon that God is a woman or that there is a heavenly mother, although some people do experience God in that way. Uh, there are also 
transgender characters in the book and um, an, an ace character who doesn't think of her of themselves as having a gender. So they all think of God in various different ways. And that has been really a useful lens for me to reconsider the idea of Heavenly Mother as a heterosexual woman married to a heterosexual man, which perhaps is not really what I'm getting at when I'm talking about the feminine divine. All right, I will tell you this very brief story. This is a picture of me <laughs> when I was in fourth grade, no, fifth grade. I was 10. And the school mangled my name, which is an unusual name, in the computer system, and it came out as Eddie. So I was Eddie this year, and I did not tell my parents that I was Eddie at school. I'm sure they could have gone and corrected the school. I liked being Eddie, and I convinced my mom to give me a, a quite a short haircut, as you can see in this photo. And then um, my birthday is in the early part of the school year, so I also convinced her to take me shopping for school clothes. And we went to Sears, because that's where my mom always shopped for clothes. And um, we walked through the women's, the, the girl section of clothes. And my mom didn't like any of the clothes because to her, they weren't practical enough. They would have required too much washing. So I coaxed her over into the boys section and I picked out a bunch of boys clothes and she bought them for me. And I loved wearing boys clothes. Now, I am not transgender and I don't think of myself as being a boy, but I did see from an early age that boys got to do things girls didn't do. like. Boys could run and chew gum and nobody told me them not to or not to fart. And those may seem like dumb things, but to me as a, as a child, I felt very strongly the restrictions of being a girl. And so it was lovely for me in this experience to find out what it was like to be a boy. And what I discovered was that the restrictions to being a boy were also restrictions I didn't like. Um, like you couldn't touch each other except punching each other. Like you couldn't hug, but you could punch. And you could never cry if you were a boy. And I eventually gave up my charade of being a boy and went back to being a girl, I guess. Again, like, that's all your labels. I don't care about whatever gender sometimes feels to me like a massive social delusion. Um, but I know I'm supposed to play along with it. Uh, so when I, when, we, when I saw the, the title for this talk was thinking about a third choice, it made me think of this experience I had as a child in which I was like, so here's the binary, you can be a girl or you can be a boy. And I didn't like either of those choices. I didn't see a third choice, really. I just went back to being me, although I tried to make my me be as much as I could be. Now, I don't know, maybe there isn't really a third choice between Mormon and ex-Mormon, but maybe we can all work on letting people be more themselves, more authentic to themselves. But um, this also was about me talking about being called and being special. Um, I started telling people at age five that I was gonna grow up to be a writer. I loved stories. I wrote stories in much of my free time. As soon as I could write myself, which was not until first grade, I would sit and write stories at home. Um, I have no idea when I added to that the idea that God wanted me to be a writer, but it was soon afterward. I felt secure in my sense of a mission in life, in the idea that this was what was meant to be. So what now? Do I still believe that God wanted me to be a writer? I don't, sort of, but I sort of do. It's complicated now because of the ways in which I've dismantled other ideas of what I was supposedly meant to be. Is there freedom allowed in being called? That is, can you say no to God? Can you say, can I be called to this? Can you volunteer to be called? Um, I wake up many days still feeling a sense of calling to sit down and write something that I hadn't planned on writing. I try to answer that call still. The Book of Mormon. I have listened to a lot of podcasts about how Joseph must have invented the Book of Mormon. Um, I do believe it is a work of fiction and not a historical record. However, I still value it. I don't know if the reason that I value it is because I grew up listening to it and treating it like scripture. Maybe that is so, but there are parts of it I find really precious. Um, I admit the Laman and Lemuel parts are not always my favorite, but King Benjamin's speech is beautiful. Um, and the letters between Pahoran and Captain Moroni are also fabulous. <laughs> um, there are just too many parts of it that I love. So what do I do? I create fan fiction for the Book of Mormon. And I know that this may offend certain groups of Mormons who think of the 
Book of Mormon as scripture, although I'm not sure why the Book of Mormon can't have fanfic when I'm sure that Mormons write Bible fanfic. Well, and then there's Chris Heimerdinger who writes um, fanfic of the Book of Mormon, but it's not quite the same as mine. It doesn't pretend to be like another book of scripture. Anyway, I this has been my way of dealing with my love of the Book of Mormon. I, I don't know that I'm trying to improve on it, but I am trying to give a different perspective on it. All right, finally, I want to talk about eternal families. <sighs> I loved being a mostly stay-at-home mother of five children. I will brag a bit here and say that whether or not I should feel pride about how brilliant and interesting and good they are, I do. This is less because I think I get credit for molding them in any way and more because I didn't ruin them by forcing them into molds that wouldn't have fit them. I used to tell my children that the rules of parenting were simple. Feed children, give them a place to stay and clothes to wear, and don't hit them. That's it. If that sounds like a low bar, let me remind you that my experience in childhood made me long for parents like that. But in truth, I also won the genetic lottery. There are plenty of problems that I and my children didn't face. I did fa face oppositional defiant disorder, ODD, and ADHD, and I could tell you some stories about one particular kid lying in the road because she didn't want to walk home from school and she thought somebody would pick her up if she was in the road where the cars went. Um, I'll skip the rest of that. As much as I love and honor my children's agency, I made a lot of mistakes with them. I'm still reckoning with some of those mistakes. I can't blame everything on Mormonism, though I will blame some of it on Mormonism. I also can't blame everything on my daughter Mercy's death, although that gets a lot too. So this is a picture of my um, my second daughter's wedding and she got married outside of the temple um, at this point, some of my kids were still in the church and some were out. My, the grandparents were all in, the extended family are mostly all in. And it was an interesting experience. I was very nervous that somehow family members would make my daughter feel that her wedding wasn't enough, wasn't the pinnacle of good weddings. Um, and in fact, uh, my, her, her grandfather did say something about her dress not being his cup of tea which I realized was code for, it wasn't modest in a Mormon way. Um, but that was a pretty mild uh, mis uh, comment to make. And, and in general, everybody was celebratory uh, appropriately in this situation. Um, but th this is just my attempt to show you, this is how my family looks. Um, my kids are, as I said before, brilliant. And you can, I'm sure tell from this photo that they are brilliant, right? <laughs> um, what about eternal families? I've been yelled at um, plenty this year. <laughs> Even before the being yelled at about the five doctrines of ex-Mormonism, I got yelled at quite a bit for talking about eternal families when my dad was in hospice. Um, but I still believe in something like eternal families. Maybe you'd call it DNA, but it matters. My dad died this year on March 1st, just before the shutdown started. This is my dad and mom with the two oldest kids in the family. I'm number nine, so I wouldn't be born for another 15 years. This is Christmas 2018, um, after I'd left Mormonism, but I really never talked to my parents about it. Um, I knew my dad was dying and I didn't wanna hurt him and I was waiting until, I, I suspect my mom will have longer to live, so I just waited. Um, this is the last photo I have of me and my dad. And this is my dad's Mormon funeral. His funeral was March 7th, and he was buried in the plot right next to my daughter, Mercy. You can't see it here, but you see those, um, those feet at the left of the screen are sitting on top of Mercy's gravestone. <laughs> um, I don't believe in an afterlife anymore. That may be in part be because it's difficult for me to deal with the sense of guilt I feel about Mercy's death. I can't bear the thought of facing her again and somehow coming, uh, saying something. I, I don't know how to be forgiven for somehow not making her live. I feel like there are a list of things I somehow should have done, I should have known, should not have done. Um, and that has made it really difficult for me to want an afterlife. And it's also true that despite many members telling me of visitations or impressions of my daughter, I've never had an experience with, like that with her spirit. My father was a difficult man in many ways. When I started investigating autism, I saw immediately that he had autism, as did other people in our family. When I got the diagnosis myself, I never shared it with him. 
He saw grandchildren with autism and he didn't argue with their diagnosis, but I think he would have told me it was ridiculous that either of us, so functional, could have had a problem. Yet when I look back at his violent outbursts, almost always when he returned from a stressful work day, I think that they must have been related in some way to the sensory overload that plagues me after a long day of being around other humans and their faces and hints. We are eternally linked, my father and I, no matter if I want to be or not. And that somehow feels really Mormon to me. This is my mom with four of the five daughters in the family. Um, I think we all look very much like her in different ways. My children will have some of the same mix of feelings about me, I suppose. Four of the five are runners or athletes of some stripe. Since my parents and my in-laws both thought running was ridiculous and tried desperately to talk me out of it by sending me obituaries of those who died in marathons, I have to assume that this penchant for racing is actually a mutation of some kind. But I love that my kids and I and my husband all race together. It is one of the things I love most about our family. We get up way too early, stumble to their starting line, and sometimes even stay with each other, though not often. We eat pre-race meals and post-race meals, and we stew with each other for hours after the race is over. It's who we are. You can see this is us at Big Bear Marathon. Uh, two of us did the half marathon, and three did the full, and all th everybody there except for me got a PR <laughs> for the race. <laughs> So now they're beating me. For many years, I beat them, and now they all beat me. Um, and this is the whole family waiting for me to finish a marathon <laughs> and just laughing and enjoying. You can tell that it is a fun family activity. We are also driven to perfection, anxious, weird, super intelligent, nerdy, and sometimes oblivious to the feelings of others. My kids this last weekend reminded me of my penchant for reading books aloud to them, but I didn't always have a good sense of what books might bother them. I read them a whole series of apocalyptic narratives that they still have nightmares about, specifically about the lack of chocolate chips. <laughs> that's what, that's what, all of my kids apparently have stockpiles of chocolate chips in fear of this apocalyptic story that I told them. Um, when I tell them the stories about my childhood with canned peaches that poisoned us and prevented us from going to Lagoon, my kids tell their stories about me and the chocolate chips and the apocalypse. Part of being an eternal family is perhaps a curse. <laughs> I don't know how to separate that from the blessing. I am who I am because of my parents, because of their parents and their parents before them, on and on back into long before humans were humans. Some things are not choices, some things are. The idea of eternal family feels very Mormon to me, even on this level of DNA. It is that weird cross section of 19th century science and humanism and religion and modern Christianity it, it produces people like me. There the family is at the half Iron Man that we invented. Um, Mormonism produces someone like me, someone who went to Princeton at age 19, fresh out of BYU off a of Benson scholarship, proud of her Mormonism enough to talk about it in the first two minutes of any conversation, proud even when she had to make coffee for the department mixer that she made it badly <laughs> because I didn't taste it. I was so Mormon then, and I am still Mormon now. Ex-Mormon, Mormon, and whatever else I'm trying to, I'm becoming. Okay, I am done, and I guess ready for questions. We have time for questions, right? Here, I'll stop Red. for sure. Thank you so much. I'm just gonna go through, we've got about five or six. Um, the first question is, about the question is i want to know what we can call ourselves <laughs> what would be a good name for that third group in your opinion i mean i have always been trying i've been trying to figure that out myself i'm trying to think of uh, so for a while i used the moniker um uh mormonish and and i've used the moniker independent mormon um I don't know. I'm still searching for for something that's the right one. I but also I don't know that we need to have labels necessarily. I think we can just. I don't, my kids say I was raised Mormon, and I think that's enough. Awesome. Thank you. Should the stages of LDS Mormonism have more than two steps? The first being baptism, and the second being endowment. 
intermittent levels between one and two allows a person to advance and or stay at any level. Any comments on that? Hmm. I don't know. I guess my first thought was there are lots of different levels. There's young women, there's the young women have medallion, there's the uh, the young men go through lots of things. They have their process of uh, deacon, teacher, priest. Um, I don't know that I want to fix Mormonism by adding more levels to it. <laughs> it feels to me like we have so many levels already of like the three degrees of glory and then the different offices and the Maya maids and Laurel, whatever the name is, they call everybody and everybody in the primary has to have a different class that they're in. I don't know. I kind of want to get rid of all of that, but maybe ultimately it's the same impulse that you're talking about when you ask that question, because um, the temple is very much a demarcation of like good Mormons. Like if you've been to the temple, then you're considered, you, you just have a different status in the church. And to me, I, I just wish that we didn't have that status marker in the church. What if all we had was baptism? And what if baptism was postponed until the teenage years? I don't know. That's what my vote would be for is let's just have people who are baptized who are old enough to choose to be baptized instead of eight-year-olds who really aren't. I'm going to tag on to that question just personally. Um, do you think that I feel like as we are younger, we really do rely on all of these steps and status accomplishments you know the young women in the seminary and the priesthood and and do you feel like the lack of that after the last one pretty much would be um temple marriage that's pretty early in a lot of people's life if there should be more after that or if we should remove like how does that um affect someone's growth or lack of growth in the church when some, when it can kind of end so abruptly in early on in life? Um, well, I, I actually think, I, I don't think of this problem in the way that you're s stating it. Um, I think what happens is that women only have eternal temple marriage as their goal. I think men have clearly defined ladders to climb after that. Elders quorum president, bishop, becoming a high priest, I mean, I know that that they've sort of um, tried to put high priests and elders back into the same category, but nonetheless, I still think that men have these ladders that they're climbing, and it's just women who don't have them. Um, so I guess to me, I would say the solution to this is women having the priesthood, which will never happen, <laughs> and um, I don't know. I, I feel like Mormonism thrives on external measures of worthiness and those are really good for children. It's one of the reasons why people talk a lot about the stages of faith um, and that Mormonism is great at like stage two and three, but then it falls apart later on because it, it, people who have moved on to other stages of faith end up not being able to stay within Mormonism because they are that there's just no space open for people to do other things. So I, I wish that, that maybe we stuck with having those kinds of stages for the children and then got rid of them gradually with the young adults. And then again, I, we just can't have a gendered system of stages. That's, it, that's what a lot of women are complaining about right now is that there's nothing past marriage. This marriage is the thing. And then after that, you as a woman are kind of useless with <laughs> like you're just you you have babies, but then then what? And I, I don't know. I just think there's no space for us um, to continue to grow and have questions and like contribute to the community, except to, like bring bread and stuff. And that's it's very frustrating that we can't move past that. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was a great insight. Um, another question. When you write fictional stories, do you feel inspired or godlike? <laughs> um, so I do, but I'm going to, to add to that a long, um, I'm going to take it back slowly because 
I, I remember going to a conference um, where someone gave a keynote at a Mormon writing conference. And one of the things that this speaker said was that when you say that God told you to write the story, his experience was that inevitably those stories were the most badly written and terribly plotted stories and have really thin characterizations. So he's told people, instead of, <laughs> instead of saying you are inspired to tell a story, learn how to be a writer and then like work within that. So I, I feel like there's a combination of skills and inspiration that have to work together to make a good story. Otherwise, like just being inspired to write something doesn't necessarily mean that it, other people should want to read it. Um, so I'm trying to do both of those that I'm trying to have some inspiration and wanting other people to read it. But I admit that every single time that I feel like I've had inspiration, that I have to be willing to admit I, I might just be wrong. That I'm, I might just not, not just on a small level. If I'm, if I'm going to say that I think that the prophet and the apostles have been terribly wrong. I have to admit, like when they were trying to get revelation from God, I have to admit I am just as likely to get something terribly, terribly wrong. And but you just have to work within that. It's a scary admission to make. Thank you. Next question. Do you know of other people with autism who are happy in Mormonism? My son has autism and he's very literal and not yet able to understand nuance. Sometimes I think the structure of the church is good for him. Just wondering your thoughts on the compatibility of Mormonism and those with autism. Yeah, I actually had a friend tell me, and I don't know if the statistic is true or not, but she said that her understanding was that there were a lot more autistic autists within Mormonism than in the general population, which has led me to wonder if there's something about Mormonism that attracts autistic people or people who have traits of autism. And if that's a genetic um, inheritance, then maybe we'd have more autistic people in the church. Um, I do think that Mormonism worked supremely well for me as a kid. Um, as an autistic kid, Mormonism gave me a structure that was very simple um, you go to church at this specific time, you have primary at this specific time. It also, I loved how it gave me built-in friends. Um, from childhood on, there were the kids in my primary who were my friends. And then even into adulthood in my 20s, in, in my 30s, I started to not appreciate the, the rules of Mormonism as much. But in my 20s, I really appreciated having assigned visiting teachers and home teachers, people who would look out for me. I look back on that now and think, um, that I didn't know how to make friends, but Mormonism made it so that I didn't know that I didn't know how to make friends because I, it, it filled in that gap for me. And my sister and I were just talking about this recently. She, um, my, my sister also thinks that she may have autism and she's really frustrated about the fact that by the time she left Mormonism, she feels like she was old enough by then that she didn't know how to learn the skills of how to make friends. And I feel like that a little bit too, that some of those, some of those chances to learn certain social skills may have been lost because Mormonism made it so easy for us. You have people come over and bring you food and you meet people at church and everybody knows your name and they assign you a calling immediately. All of those things were great for my, my autism when I was under 30 and less great when I was older and started to understand that these people were assigned my friends and that we didn't actually have very much in common and that the friendships weren't as robust as maybe I would like them to be now. Thank you for that answer. Next question, for those of us struggling with an identity crisis, along with our faith transition, do you have any advice on where to seek a sense of belonging that Mormonism once provided? I mean, I have an essay I'm working on about this because I'm very much afraid that the sense of community and the identity that I got from Mormonism, which I loved, may in fact be cult-like and that me trying to search for them in other places may be really unhealthy and lead me to other cults. Um, so I'm not sure, I, I think we might have to give up the idea that we are going to have 
a Mormon community outside of Mormonism because we are not going to get love bombing. You're not going to get that happiness that Mormonism seemed to give you. And you're not going to get that identity. Again, I feel like that identity was handed to me. And for a long time, I loved that it was handed to me. I am a Mormon. I'm called. I'm special. And I am unique. And God has a mission for me. All of those were such great things at a certain age. And then they just became a prison for me later. So I think that I would recommend that you hold your identity loosely and that you look for more loose community structures, because otherwise I'm afraid that we are all going to be led to have another cult experience because we want so desperately to have that kind of tie that Mormonism gave us in an unhealthy way. Thank you. We've got three questions at this point. We might have more adding on, but um, moving on to the next one. In your opinion, can a church be strangled in its own past? Said differently, can a church flush and reboot, keeping good concepts and dropping bad ones? Businesses bankrupt or restructure can church as well. I, I mean, I think that they can. Um, I, I have wondered about Community of Christ, as I said, I'm going to be investigating them as a church to see if they fixed the sorts of things that I would need to be fixed within Mormonism. Um, I, I have to admit, I'm not sure what it would look like to fix all of the things because a lot, like I say, I don't know that community that feels like it's cult like, and I don't want that part, but then if it doesn't have community, what does it have in its place? Um, so I, I don't know if I have a great answer for this. Uh, I, I don't believe that any of the current leadership of the, of the LDS Mormon Church have any interest in massive changes. For all of the changes that Russell M. Nelson has put into place, they're all tiny, nitpicky, little changes. I don't know. I mean, I feel like that's strong words because I think a lot of my Mormon friends would argue with me and say, but the w women as witnesses and um, the change in the temple ceremony. But I don't think... Uh, I think I would call those first order changes and not second order changes. Second order changes are changes that grapple with the very structure of the church, which to me right now is the patriarchy. And until someone starts asking and looking seriously at that structure, I don't see the church making meaningful changes in any way. Awesome. Thank you. In your opinion, does Mormonism attach too much meaning to life's events that are random coincidences? <laughs> yes, obviously. Um, do we attach too much meaning to random events? Uh, I mean, everything has to have a meaning. That, that was one of the problems with my daughter's death that I kept looking for the answer to like why it happened. I wanted there to be some nice narrative to wrap it up and like, oh, then if I learned this lesson, then that won't happen again. I wanted to have to control over my world. And that was one of the hardest things about going through that experience was realizing there, there wasn't a reason that happened. It was an accident. That, that's all. There wasn't, there wasn't a grand reason. God didn't make it happen. It was just probably my body failed. Nobody knew. And, you know, everybody tried to make that not happen. But sometimes just I was the tiny statistical anomaly in this sort of a situation. And I had a, you know, just a bad, it, it wasn't anybody's fault. It just happened. It just it just happened. There was no reason for it. And I think that it's really hard within Mormonism to say things like that because people want to have a sense that God is in control of everything. And, and the God that I believe in now isn't in control of everything. Um, I know that sounds weird. Like what kind of a God is not in control of things, but that's just how I've come to it. Like God is there for us to talk to about stuff that happens, but God doesn't have control over the things that happen. Um, in a way, also, that is probably a very Mormon God, because Mormon God is limited by the rules of the universe in ways that other Christian gods are not limited by the rules of the universe. What are you thinking about? That doesn't make, you know, that takes away God's omniscience. That doesn't make him God anymore. Um, but yeah, I mean, we always, as Mormons, want to tell stories so that everything ties together and leads us down the path of, yes, the church is true. 
yes, God is up there. Yes, eternal family. Like everything points to yes. <laughs> awesome. We've got two more. I think we may just have time for one. Um, you can look and reply at these in the app later on as well. Okay. Um, someone is admiring your wallpaper in the back of the books from the floor to the ceiling. Is it a metaphor for your heart and mind? <laughs> I have three or four um, backgrounds that I use whenever I'm doing Zoom because I'm actually in my basement uh, in my exercise room. I moved down here when the COVID shutdown happened because suddenly everybody was home. My two youngest kids were home. One is was a senior in high school and the other was finishing, uh, preparing for law school. And my husband was home too. And I couldn't work in my usual spot, which is on the couch in the living room, because I would just be interfering with other people and they would be interfering with me. So, so now I'm stuck down here. And um, I tried to do some Zoom videos with my actual background. And somebody said that nobody wants to see a Zoom video with um, my treadmill and my bike behind me, but that's what actually is behind me. Um, is it a metaphor for me? I mean, I love books. I have a lot of books in my house, maybe not as many as on this wallpaper, um, but yeah, I mean, I would love to live in a library. <laughs> that would be my second choice after living in a gym. Awesome. Thank you so much. I think that we we will wrap it up at this point because we've just all right. Got Thank you minute. for everybody coming. No, thank I didn't. You, I didn't you so much. Burst into flame. Nobody lit me on fire. So thank you all. Awesome. Our next sessions will begin at four fifty. So we've got a little bit of time break. But thanks so much, Mitty. Again, it was great, and thank you to all the attendees for being here and for participating in the Q and A's. Thanks for moderating. Thanks. Have a great night.